Hi, this is Ron Sipsick, and this is the second part of a two-part series on excise taxes. And we developed the excise tax model in part one and showed how consumers lose and producers, producers lose and how government wins uh, through the imposition of excise taxes. Now, what I've done here in part two is bring the same numbers forward, and uh, I've First of all, I've just drawn a better looking model because I used the straight line function here. My hand hasn't gotten any steadier, but uh, I am using the technology here. All right, anyway, I've set, up, I've set up the model, and let me just quickly review some of the key concepts, uh, a little one-minute uh, review of the first video. Remember, if there is no tax, we're on the original supply curve over here to the right. We get a different color going. And uh, if we are uh, under a no tax assumption, uh, then you're on S1. So the supply curve to the right is the no tax supply curve. The equilibrium price is 8, and the equilibrium quantity is 10. When the tax was imposed, the remember the supply curve shifted up $2. But when the price settled back down to equilibrium, it turned out to be a $1.50 increase in the equilibrium price with the producer receiving a net price of $7.50. So we see that the difference between the price the consumer pays at $9.50 and the price that the producer receives at $7.50 is the tax. And of course, S2 is our with tax supply curve. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use our consumer surplus, producer surplus model, and we're going to talk more deeply about this winner and loser issue. And what I will end up showing you is the welfare effects of this tax on the market. Okay, to do this, I need to, to do some labeling. I need to label this area A, this area B, this area C, this area D, this area here E this area F and this area G. Now effectively what I've done is I have labeled the area below the demand curve and above the original supply curve. Let me label my demand curve here. So I've labeled the area below the demand curve and above the original supply curve. This area, this entire area is called societal surplus. And what we've done is we've identified every area in that area so we can talk about changes in those areas. All right, now let's jump right in. I want to move the model down. Actually, move below the model, so I'll move the model up. Oh, I didn't leave myself. Well, I'm going to have to go the other way, so let's do that. I started at the bottom of the canvas, not at the top of the canvas, but we are going to uh, improvise. So let's, let's put the model up here. And so we'll have one, uh, we're going to set up a table with columns. This column will have actually four, we'll have four columns in this table. So go ahead and draw this with me. Very strongly suggest that you write these things out. The more you write things, the more easily you'll remember them. And this will have really two row, rows and a net effect area at the bottom. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. Okay, this will be consumer surplus, producer surplus, government surplus. This is new. We have not uh, used this in our analysis so far. And then adding all those areas together, societal surplus, this is the no tax policy, and this is with the excise tax. Okay, and this area down here, we can label net effect. Okay, I'm going to go back to my color. We're going to go ahead and scroll back down so we can look at the model, and we'll be flipping back and forth here, so I hope you don't get dizzy. So let's, let's come back here. Now, Remember what consumer surplus is. Consumer surplus is the area above the price line, above the price line, and below the demand curve. So if there is no tax, if there is no tax, 
then the price is what? With no tax, the price is $8. So the consumer pays $8. Above a price of 8, below the demand curve is what? Consumer surplus. So consumers get areas A, B, C, and D. So let's go ahead and take that up and uh, take that up to our table, put that in our table. And so we'll put, sorry about that, get rid of that scrolling feature, A, B, C, and D. Okay, now let's scroll back down and let's take a look at the model. Producers, what do they get? They get below the price line, below the price line, $8 above the original supply curve. We go to the original supply curve because we're doing the no tax, the no tax outcome. So they get what? They get E, F, and G. Sorry about that. Let me leave that out. They get E, F, and G below the price line above the supply curve. So let's go ahead and go back up. What did they get? They got E, F, and G. Okay. Hang on there. All right. So let's go ahead and write those in E, F, and G. Now, if there's no tax, think about this. If there's no tax, the government doesn't get any area. The government doesn't uh, take any part of the outcome. So societal surplus is therefore just consumer surplus plus producer surplus. So it's going to be A through, uh, let's see, A, B, C, D, E, F, A through G. I learned my ABCs from a woman named Miss, Mrs. Kelly. She was my kindergarten teacher. Actually, my mom started with me a little bit before kindergarten. So Mrs. Kelly was my kindergarten teacher, and Mrs. Kelly really worked with me on my ABCs. So to this day, when I actually write out the ABCs, I think of Mrs. Kelly, my kindergarten teacher. That was a commercial break from your sponsor. All right, let's go back to our regular programming. After the tax, look where the price goes. After the tax, where is the price? The price is way up here, PE2. So the consumer pays $9.50 and only consumes out to $9 million. So the consumer gets the area above the price line, below the demand curve. All right, so let's scroll up. Well, this is a little bit cumbersome to do it piece by piece, but let's do this. So the consumer only gets what? The consumer only gets area what? Consumer gets A. So the consumer loses what? B, C, and D, which means the consumer loses. Whoop. Get rid of that one there. So the consumer loses, and so we'll just put a net effect of a, of a negative there. All right, and scroll back down. Now this is probably the trickiest step. Um, this is probably the hardest one to see. In evaluating the producer's outcome with the tax, we have to think net of tax. Remember, the consumer pays $9.50, but the producer only nets $7.50. So we can actually, even when the tax is imposed, we can think of this supply curve as the net of tax supply curve. In other words, what the effect is after the tax is accounted for. So what the producer actually gets is $750. Well, the area below the price the producer actually nets and above the original supply curve, which is the net of tax supply curve, producer only gets area G. It's very interesting. So the producer loses E and F. So let's, let's come up here. We're looking at the producer, but we're looking at the producer Sorry about that. With the excise tax. So the producer gets G, loses E, loses F, therefore the producer loses. Now, this is not news to us. We already knew that the consumer loses and we knew that the producer loses. In fact, in the last video, we actually calculated the amounts of those losses. All right. But this, this gives us a visual. This, this, is a, this is a graph of the losses. And so consumers lose B, C, and D, that's lost consumer surplus. Producers lose E and F, that's lost producer surplus. Now, how does the government do? All right, well, let's go back to the model. 
And I'm actually going to bring another color into the analysis here. And let's go with, that's asparagus. Let's go with mocha. Mocha. The, the consumer pays seven seven fifty, but the producer nets seven fifty. So who gets the difference? Well, this difference here, this vertical distance, is actually what this vertical distance is what the producer gets per unit, and then if you multiply that times the number of units, nine million, what we have is a box. We have a, we have a box. In fact, we can come out here. I'll, I'll, I'll put this box out here. If we take this box, you have a box that is what? B, C, and E. Now, how long is that box? That box is 9 million units long. Well, how wide is that box? That box is $2 wide. So if you take the width of the box, 2, times the length of the box, you get what? You get the area, and that area is actually the 18 million that we talked about back in video one. So 18 million is government tax revenues. So this box is actually known, it's actually known as the tax wedge. And that's the tax wedge in dollars is 18 million. And we can also identify it as an area. So this is the wedge that the government, this is the piece of the action that the government pulls out of the market. So let's go ahead and, and move up. I'm going to go back to my original color. All right, so let's go up. So government gets what? B, C, and E. So let's write that in. Um, B, C, and E, so the government actually gains B, C, and E. So as we said in the first video, the government gains. Now, this is, yeah, this is obviously going to mean more employment in government and better benefits, and it's going to mean more job security and all those things for government employees, but let's, let's not be too cynical here. Let's assume that governments actually do good things with the money we receive, and they do. So these tax revenues are going to be received by some governmental unit, and these gover the governmental unit will spend these monies on either services or, or goods, and the citizenry, let's hope, benefits. So maybe this is education, and the money spent on teachers and spent on schools is actually going to lead to the further education of, of students. Let's be optimistic about this. So government wins consumers and producers lose. What's the net effect from a societal standpoint point with the excise tax? Society gets what? A, B, C, careful, E, and G. So what does society lose? Society loses what? D and F. Society loses. And this actually has got a name. This is lost societal surplus but in economics we're going we always want to like every discipline we we have big names for things we have a language that goes with our uh, reality and this lost this lost societal surplus actually has a name it's called a dead weight dead weight loss Okay, but a deadweight loss is lost societal surplus. So society is worse off. There's a, there's a, the, this tax actually reduces output in the market. Now, let, let's say this is cigarettes. You can say, well, that's good. Cigarettes are bad for people. And if you're a non-smoker, you're probably thinking, well, gee, this is good. This is, this is going to reduce the number of cigarettes sold, and that's good. But remember, cigarettes are a good and I, to the buyer they are. The person who smokes cigarettes consider, gets value from them. So any, any policy action that actually reduces the production of a good is going to be considered a bad from the standpoint of the consumer. So this, this, this 
reduction in output leads to what? The loss of this area right here. And this area that I'm shading in right here is the dead weight loss. And so the market was getting, was enjoying a uh, consumer and producer surplus of A, B, C, and D, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Now the market is only uh, getting societal surplus of A, B, C, E, and G. D and F are being lost or cut off. And this is what happens when a market is underproducing. There's going to be a dead loss equal to an area that looks like D and F. Okay? Sometimes, uh, sometimes policymakers are actually willing to uh, do this to a market because the, the product is considered to be so harmful to society overall that it's worth this dead weight loss to cause the market to underproduce. Uh, but again, I think it's important to remember that cigarette smokers get value from cigarettes. They're legal, and to that extent, uh, the market is causing it, the market is being caused to underproduce by this policy. All right. So you'll see this theme as you look at many, many government policies: price ceilings, price floors, excise taxes. These are called market distortions, and the primary way that these uh, government policies Again, let me list them, price ceilings, price floors, and excise taxes. And you could even expand this to tariffs. Tariffs on imported tariffs are taxes on imported products. Really, tariffs are an excise tax. But the, but the effect of these policies on markets is to often cause these markets to underproduce, to cause these markets to produce less than they would otherwise produce, and thereby uh, causing consumers and producers to lose welfare that they might otherwise have had. Okay? All right, that concludes video two on excise taxes and markets.